Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. On the second Wednesday of each month, we discuss the latest bioscience publications. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to bioscience.oxfordjournals.org. For today's episode, I'm joined by Dr. Bridget Deemer. She's a postdoc ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, although today we'll be discussing work from her Ph.D. studies at Washington State University. She's here to talk to us about a major source of greenhouse gases that often goes unconsidered, and that's reservoirs. It turns out that they're an enormous source of greenhouse gases, and Dr. Deemer's work involves figuring out the size and scope of the problem. So let's get straight to the interview. Dr. Deemer, thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Great. And we're going to move pretty quickly into your specific findings. But before we do, I was hoping you could give us just a little bit of background on reservoirs in general as a source of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, It's an idea that, you know, many of our listeners may not be wholly familiar with. And it would be great to get a little bit of background. So, you know, what's the mechanism behind that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of people kind of squint their eyes when they hear greenhouse gases and reservoirs. Uh, But it actually turns out that all natural aquatic ecosystems also produce greenhouse gases. Uh, And you can basically think of it as microbes decomposing or rotting organic matter. So plants, other living things that are either growing in the reservoir or enter the reservoir, um, or organic matter that's in the soil before it's even flooded. Um, these microbes <clears throat> start to rot it, and in that process, they, they need to breathe. And so some of the microbes breathe just like we do. They breathe in oxygen, and they breathe out carbon dioxide. And that actually gives microbes the most amount of energy. They really like to breathe oxygen. But in areas uh, that aren't very well mixed, like aquatic systems, you can get these low oxygen zones that develop. And then the microbes actually start to breathe out methane gas. Um, And nitrous oxide is also emitted as a process uh, during the process of decomposition um, and also uh, due to some other nitrogen transformations. Okay, so essentially what happens is you set up a dam or something like that, you flood the area, and then you get this microbial growth. And as a result of the microbial growth, um, you have these greenhouse gas emissions. That's correct. And it, it turns out that in reservoirs, there's disproportionately more greenhouse gas emitted than uh, in some of these natural systems. <clears throat> So how did how did, how would that compare to an, uh, another natural system? You know, so you'd get you would get more greenhouse gases from a reservoir than say you would from an undammed river. Yeah, so part of part of it has to do with the the accessibility of oxygen to the microbes, um, and in stagnant waters, uh, it's a lot harder for oxygen to be mixed down to where all that decomposition is happening, uh, and so you can get more methane emission that way. Um, But another part of it we think just has to do with the special nature of reservoirs. So I'm really interested in reservoir systems because they're human designed and they're human operated. So uh, we could start to think about them as having some special characteristics just specifically because we're, we're choosing where to put them on the landscape. Um, And this is sort of an active area of research, but there's a few different ideas about why reservoirs might emit more greenhouse gas. Uh, And one of those is that they tend to be draining larger catchments compared to their surface area. So they might be getting more organic matter inputs that way. Um, Another idea is that they might be closer to uh, human activities, which can introduce nutrients, uh, which we found might be linked to greenhouse gas emission because they're going to promote more growth, so more material to decompose. Um, and then also there might be some special aspects of the way that uh, they're managed that could lead to enhanced greenhouse gas emission. Okay, yeah, and I suspect we'll get more into the the management aspect later. Um, one thing I was I was curious about, though, was uh, how is this measured? What, what kind of techniques are used to find out that reservoirs are emitting greenhouse gases? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And it's actually uh, sort of been a, a topic of a lot of research because it's actually, it can be really challenging to accurately measure the greenhouse gas emissions coming from these systems. So one of the simplest ways to estimate greenhouse gas emission is actually just to go out and grab some water samples from the surface of the reservoir. And and then we look to see how much CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide is dissolved in that water. 
Um, and the idea is that if there's more of these gases dissolved in the water than what we would expect just based on equilibration with the atmosphere, that uh, that excess gas can be attributed to emission. And there are a number of different ways to model emission uh, where you look at how windy the system is, how exposed it is, and, um, and you model how quickly that excess gas is escaping to the atmosphere. And that's what a lot of people, uh, especially early on, that was the, the main approach that people took to estimating emission. Um, but it turns out in the case of methane that methane actually doesn't really like to dissolve in water. It's not very soluble. And so uh, it's really easy for bubbles to form in, this, in the sediment or in other areas where these decomposing, decomposing microbes are active. Um, and those bubbles can, can rise up through the water column and be emitted to the atmosphere. And we, would, we entirely miss that component of the emission by just looking at the, at the dissolved component. Um, and in some cases, that can be 95% of the methane emission or more from a, a reservoir. So it's, it's very easy, you know, and, and perhaps historically has been the case that you get these um, underestimates of the amount of gas that's being released. Yeah, if you're not looking at the bubbling emission, then you can really underestimate. And even when you do look at the bubbling, it's, it can be really hard to capture because uh, the amount of bubbling can really vary depending on where you look in the reservoir and when you're looking in the reservoir. Um, but it's actually, it's a lot of fun to measure, I think, because um, you know, normally when you're measuring these processes, processes you really don't see anything. Uh, while you're taking a sample, um, but with the bubbles, you can actually, we, we actually put these funnels out in reservoirs and the funnels actually capture the gas so you can go out and pull, pull the gas and imagine the volume of bubble, bubbling that was happening at that site, which I think is, is a pretty neat thing um, to see. Okay, so I, I'm getting sort of a sense of, you know, how this is measured on the local scale. Um, but what I'm wondering is, you know, looking at your article, you, you come up with a global estimate. And I'm wondering how that is scaled. You know, how do you go from local estimates to sort of a worldwide number? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and actually, in this case, it's, it's somewhat of a arguably simplistic approach, but we felt that it was the best approach with the information that we had. And, and so what we actually did was we just took an average emission value from all of the systems that uh, where we had a greenhouse gas emission estimate available, uh, we multiplied it by an estimate of reservoir surface area. And so ideally, what we would really like to do is to be able to um, look at some of the controlling factors on greenhouse gas emissions, and then say something about how, you know, the properties of reser reservoirs globally um, and how that relates to a controlling variable. Uh, but we really couldn't do that here. So what we found in the study is that uh, reservoirs that are more productive, that receive more nutrients and have more biological growth are emitting more uh, greenhouse gas on a CO2 equivalent basis than their less productive counterparts. Uh, but we really don't know on a global scale um, how many reservoirs are what we call eutrophic or highly productive versus how many reservoirs are oligotrophic or low productivity systems. So we have some indication that there's a lot more productive systems than there are unproductive systems. Um, but for this, for this analysis, we, we just took average, average numbers for both the, the uh, greenhouse gas flux and the surface area. Okay, so looking at those broad averages, is this a significant problem? Is this a significant source of CO2 equivalents, you know, that should really be considered and worried about? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think uh, the term significant is sort of a loaded question. It really depends, I guess, on how, how you decide what you think is significant or not. Um, but we estimated that we conservatively estimated that reservoirs are responsible for about 1.3% of human-caused CO2 equivalent emissions. 
Um, and that, that's comparable to other uh, emissions that are currently included in the IPCC inventory process. Um, so emissions like those from rice cultivation or biomass burning. Um, and so we argue in our paper that it's, we think it's appropriate that reservoirs be included in these national inventory estimates. Um, and when we start to think about uh, what, what is a significant source, we can't just target one thing. We have to kind of understand how everything uh, works, works in concert. And so acknowledging that these systems are a source of greenhouse gases, I think, is an important step in that direction. Okay, so right now we have a situation in which the International Panel on Climate Change um, doesn't consider these. You know, they're, they're considering contributors of similar quantities of greenhouse gases, but reservoirs aren't among them? That's correct. So currently reservoirs are listed as an appendix in uh, the methodology that d describes how particular countries should inventory their greenhouse gas emissions. But there are actually a handful of authors on this paper that are involved in an international group that's, uh, that's working to write new methodology. So there is a potential to include this in future IPCC estimates? That's correct. And what are the implications of that? You know, what happens if you include reservoirs in IPCC estimates? That's a great question. I, I think there's a few implications. One is just that it uh, will start to be on people's radar screens more. Um, so that if a country has to include reservoirs as a source of greenhouse gases, that makes um, those people that are involved in uh, policy decision making aware that this is a, a source of greenhouse gases gases. Um, secondarily, it's also motivation for individual countries to start measuring uh, greenhouse gas emissions in different types of systems. So uh, we've had a huge increase in the number of reservoirs where people have gone out and measured greenhouse gases, but there's still a, a long way to go. And uh, the inventory process is a tiered process where uh, scientists recommend different approaches for estimating emission um, that countries can sort of pick between depending on their capacity and, and the number of estimates that they already have from reservoirs um, uh, within, their, within their country. Um, and then thirdly, I, I think one big missing piece is, um, is, is a good understanding of reservoir surface area globally. Uh, and so this might be motivation for uh, better inventories of, of even how much surface area reservoirs are covering in different countries. So it's largely at this point, uh, simply a matter of kind of, you know, getting reservoirs into the mix and um, taking them seriously as a source of greenhouse gases. I think so. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering then, you know, so what are the management implications um, potentially from your work? If we were a country level or uh, even, you know, a state level or smaller governance entity, and we were looking at how to best manage reservoirs, is there anything that we can take away? You know, is there, is there anything that can be learned um, that might have an influence positively on um, lowering the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we have? Yeah, uh, so we were pretty excited to see this relationship between uh, productivity, biological productivity of the reservoir and greenhouse gas emission. Uh, and I think I touched on this a little bit before, uh, but the more nutrients and the more algal growth within a reservoir, uh, we found that those systems would have higher methane emission and higher overall CO2 equivalent emission uh, than the less productive systems. And in my mind, what this means for management is that uh, when we're thinking about placing additional reservoirs, uh, we can really start to potentially think strategically about how, how much, where they're placed on the landscape and whether or not that siting is going to put them in the path of a lot of nutrient inputs and protect potentially lead to more production or whether or not we could place them in areas where they're uh, likely to intercept less nutrient loading and therefore less uh, 
experience less biological productivity. Um, another idea is, is that uh, we might be able to manage the nutrient inputs in existing reservoirs and that this might reduce emission um, in, in reservoirs that already, uh, that already exist, although that would really need additional experimental work to see uh, how effective that could be. It would be exciting if that was effective because uh, nutrient loading is associated with a number of other negative ecosystem consequences. So um, if nutrient management also led to less greenhouse gas emission, that would sort of be a win-win for uh, aquatic ecology. Okay, so that kind of covers it at the landscape scale. But I'm wondering if there are any considerations at the global geographic scale. Um, you know, is there any indication that countries that are of a latitude where there might be higher expected productivity, for instance, uh, should be perhaps less inclined to build reservoirs? Yeah, that's a great question. It was actually something that we, uh, that we thought might be the case when we started this investigation. So there have been a number of papers that have come out that have linked reservoir greenhouse gas emission to latitude, and they found that tropical low latitude systems, and particularly systems in the Amazon, they found that these systems were emitting a lot more greenhouse gas uh, CO2 equivalents than, um, than systems further north. But we actually did not find that to be the dominant control on emissions. So there was a weak relationship between methane emission and latitude, um, but there was actually no significant difference between uh, methane emission in the Amazon and in other parts of the world. Um, and and uh, productivity, like I said, was a, a lot uh, stronger predictor of overall emission. Um, so... So yeah, we really didn't find that um, that lower latitude systems would have particularly more emission. Well, that's good because it seems like you could easily end up with a situation in which you were telling potentially less wealthy countries around the equator that um, you know they would be doing the environment a disservice if they were to build hydropower plants, whereas um, you know northern latitude countries go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I, I think. I'll, this is sort of an interesting case because I think in a lot of uh, ecology and, and biology, we have this sort of disproportionate focus on northern systems, but actually Brazil has been really active in the amount of research that's come out on uh, reservoir greenhouse gas emissions because of um, the reliance on hydropower in that country and sort of this um, trade-off with, uh, yeah, tropical deforestation and uh, other other energy issues there. Okay, so what are some future areas for research? You know, what what are the next things that need to be looked at um, in order to sort of you know widen the scope and get a clearer view of what's actually going on in terms of um, reservoir greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, so that's a, a big question. I think there's a lot of future research avenues, and we sort of outlined a few um, a few big ones in the synthesis paper. Um, but in my mind, uh, one of the big ones is just being able to get a better handle on this um, hot spot, hot moment, sort of spatial and temporal variability in emission. Um, and, and a part of that is the role of ice out. Um, a part of that is, is kind of zooming in and looking at the role of boreal systems in particular, because there's actually been quite a limited amount of work done to look at this bubbling emission in boreal systems. Um, so there are, um, there's sort of this um, qualitative acknowledgement that maybe bubbling isn't as important in boreal systems. Uh, but when we look at published studies, it's actually kind of across the board. Some of them are really low, um, have really low bubbling compared to that uh, diffusive or dissolved flux that I was talking about, and some of them are really high, um, but it's it's a pretty small number of, of studies. Um, and then I think uh, another big one is just thinking about reservoir typology. Um, so our paper looked at not just hydroelectric systems, but all different types of reservoirs um, or dammed systems. 
Um, and there's reason to think that run of river systems might have less emission than more storage based systems, but it's, it's actually somewhat challenging to develop a definition of, yeah, what is a run of river versus a storage system. And, and then even if we did have a classification scheme for that, how do we, knowing how many of each type of system there are is a challenge. That's interesting. So clearly more to be studied there. You talked also in your paper about the carbon budget and, you know, potential implications there and, you know, further areas in which we may not have all the information that we need right now. So we we really focus our discussion on CO2 equivalent emissions and thinking about reservoirs as greenhouse gas emitters. Um, but there's also the question about how reservoirs are affecting the carbon budget. And this paper re represents just a piece of a much larger puzzle uh, that we need to put together to really understand how these systems are influencing uh, global carbon cycling. So we know that reservoirs can bury a lot of carbon. Um, we, we don't know much about what the long-term fate of that carbon is in the sediments behind reservoirs. Um, there have been a few studies that have looked at the greenhouse gas balance of land prior to flooding, um, but that's also an important piece of the picture in terms of understanding how these systems are changing uh, carbon budgets. Um, and then finally, uh, just this life cycle analysis perspective of, of, yeah, the whole influence of building and decommissioning a reservoir on the, on the lifetime of, uh, on the emissions associated with that structure over its full lifetime. So you're building potentially a, you know, a holistic view that looks at the entire life cycle of the dam from its construction until its decommissioning? Correct. And also from the carbon budgeting perspective, needing to look at carbon burial. So we, we're talking about gross fluxes of greenhouse gases. Um, and in the case of methane, we know it's so much more potent than carbon dioxide um, that, you know, one unit of carbon emitted as methane uh, is a lot more concerning for, uh, for greenhouse the greenhouse gas effect than um, one uh, unit of carbon emitted as CO2. Yeah, and that raises something that we haven't talked about as much, which is the differences between these various greenhouse gases. Uh, and that was a big point of the article. So could you just tell us a little bit about that? So one of the big findings of this study was that the per area rates of methane emission were higher than what was previously thought. And methane actually contributed about 80% of the overall uh, CO2 equivalent emissions from these systems. Um, and you had mentioned that you were interested in policy um, implications. And I think uh, one interesting policy implication there is that, like I said, methane is a lot more powerful than CO2 on a CO, than CO2 um, in terms of its greenhouse effect. And that there's also a matter of timing there where for this paper, we looked at the 100 year time scale, and we assumed that methane is about 34 times more powerful than CO2. But if you start to look on these shorter time scales, like a 20 year time horizon, methane is actually 86 times more powerful than CO2. So when we start to think about uh, international goals for staying below like two degrees warming, methane becomes really important um, in sort of the, the short term horizon. Um, and we, we know that reservoir construction is booming globally. So even though in the United States we're in sort of a net decommissioning phase, globally uh, there are a huge number of hydropower projects moving forward. Um, and our study suggests that those new projects are going to have a larger uh, effect on greenhouse gas emissions than what was previously thought. So that's sort of a sobering accounting difference if uh, methane is 86 times more powerful than carbon dioxide uh, over the shorter 20-year time scale. Um, that's a pretty big accounting effect. Yeah, it's sort of, it's, it's an open, I think that's, it's a 
policy question, uh, but that deserves scientific in input in terms of, yeah, what is the relevant time span to be thinking about um, these different emissions at this point in time? The, the standard is 100 years, but um, we're bumping up against some, some um, tight windows in terms of uh, the goals that we're trying to set regarding uh, global temperatures, temperature increases. That's interesting. So, you know, even more reason to take very seriously the role of reservoir greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, let's leave it there. Dr. Deemer, thank you very much for joining me today. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was a pleasure. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you and talk to you next time.